record. Okay, so uh, last time uh, we uh, we have uh, spoken about the uh, the lazy technique for uh, uh, SMT solving. Okay, and we have seen that this is a combination of uh, CDCL sat solving. Uh, which handles the, the Boolean component or reason or, or a formula and a theory specific um, theory solver, the decision procedure theory solver, which handles sets of uh, literals. I would say better sets of atoms because typically many literal can be dually written as most typically written dually um, uh, as, as single atoms. Uh, so one is knows well how to do Boolean reasoning, but know nothing, nothing about the theory. The other uh, know everything about the theory, but it cannot do Boolean reasoning. And uh, this this synergy between these two more uh, solvers in order to uh, to to solve uh, the, the combination of the two. So the uh, um, uh, we have seen some techniques to maximize this interaction. The most important is uh, that of uh, by jumping and learning, and the idea is that the conflict sets, so theory conflict sets, so th the subsets of the theory which are consistent, are substantially treated as conflict sets in the, in the formula. I would like to insist on this last fact. So uh, this is not conceptually different from uh, the uh, the case of a SAT, of pure SAT. So just you can pre when you are finding a truth assignment which is inconsistent, uh, and you have and you have found a, a clause, a, a clause, uh, a valid clause that is a key lemma uh, on top of uh, uh, which is the negation of your conflict set. It's simply the case that you simply pretend that that lemma was already there before. Because in some sense it was, right? It was as part of the theory. So just to pretend that such solver had known that theory lemma a priori, and then behave as if the, the current of assignment violates this lemma. Okay? That's more or less the, the idea. I will say something in a few steps from now. I just wanted to mention that there are some other techniques to or other approaches for solving a um, uh, SMT, but they are not so su successful. So um, there has been some attempt to combine uh, OBDDs with the theory. Uh, they had some success in some specific applications, but overall uh, they were never able to, to gain the efficiency of our CDCL-based SMT solvers. Um, and also uh, we have also tried uh, local search to, in, to integrate local search technique with SMT. And let me say we did a work on that, but it was a complete failure substantially. And the main reason is that uh, the key point of SMT is the capability of learning uh, lemmas. And um, stochastic local search is not much suitable for, uh, for learning. So CDCL based uh, um, SMT solving is, curr is currently by far the, the most interesting uh, uh, approach. There are variations of that, like model-based um, SMT, which is uh, an evo a further evolution of CDCL, but this exceeds a little our context here. Okay, I just wanted to give you a different perspective on what uh, SMT is. And uh, the perspective, so just to clarify better how it works. And I give you the perspective, what happens in SMT solving from the perspective of a SAT solver. Okay, so, so well, you are the SAT solver and you are asked to solve uh, the, uh, uh, an SMT problem, in the sense of the Boolean abstraction on an SMT problem. So what happens is like uh, an SMT, uh, a SAT solver who is given who has to solve a problem on the conjunction of two formulae, of which one is the original formula, the Boolean abstraction of the original formula, and the other is a hidden formula, okay? He doesn't know a priori. So, 
substantially the problem to solve is the satisfiability of phi p and uh, tau p okay where phi, phi p is the boolean structure of the original formula and tau p are the boolean structure of the set of all the theory lemmas that you can build on top of the atoms of p so all the valley clauses that you can build on top of p so it, it is as if your such solver had to solve a problem on, on these two formulas. Okay, so here are the formula and here are the satellite. But unfortunately, at the beginning, you don't know PP. Okay, so it's easy to see that phi is satisfiable in the theory if and only if uh, these uh, two, the conjunction of these two formulas is satisfied in the good case. So you have to think uh, this as a as a sort of strange uh, dialogue, okay? So initially, the SAT solver, she's the SAT solver, uh, uh, sees, sees uh, phi p. But unfortunately, there is a wall, and she cannot see the, she, she doesn't know the theory lemma, because the SAT solver knows nothing about the, the theory, right? So he reasoned in the, so here is the, the, the Boolean space, and to some extent, here is the theory space, right? Okay, so uh, she's good at doing uh, solving, and then she finds a truth assignment which satisfies of phi p. Okay, yes, but unfortunately, she, she doesn't know if phi p also satisfies tau p because she doesn't know tau p. Unfortunately, she has a friend, which is the theory solver, who stays on top of the wall. Okay. Who can see inside the 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 theory world? Okay, so he has access to TP. Okay, so this guy is the theory solver, and uh, so she she asked the theory solver, "Hey theory solver, uh, does uh, a mute, uh, my tooth assignment satisfy tau p? Yes or no?" Um, well, he looks there and say, and he checks it if uh, uh, mu pre satisfies all the possible uh, dilemmas. And uh, he say he can return other two perspective. Okay, say okay, look, yes, it returns up. Yes, so it also satisfies TP. Or no, and look, here are some of the clauses in the tau p who are falsified. Okay. So you, so the the set solver can add the, those clauses that he returns, and uh, and go ahead. So substantially, a very something. That, why I'm saying that? Because if you think about that, what we have just seen is the set solver reasoning on. Uh, uh, so the, think of the big jumping and learning. Big jumping and learning is just standard back jumping and learning once you have added to the, the to the formula the theory lemma okay even theory propagation can be seen as a unit propagation on a new theory lemmas on demand so substantially you provide this also called the lemmas on demand okay and uh, this is nothing else that such solving over formula plus some lemmas which are asked to be added on demand when needed when any theory related issue is uh, is needed okay so for instance if you have this uh, simple for this formula here okay and uh, okay if you build uh, if this is the boolean structure well, if here you can build all the possible theory lemmas that you can build on, on top of those clauses here, on those atoms here, and here are some, okay? So the SAT solver can reason on this formula here and uh, tell, uh, okay, I have a truth assignment here, okay? So you can ask the theory solver, Okay, who, which clauses in uh, which amount of the possible clauses are violated? Okay, yes, there are two of them which are violated. Okay, so 
one market uh, here in black and the other market with the red, okay? So they are returned and added to the formula and then they use the procedure. So you, you can add those two, two clauses to the sub solving, to the original formula, that's learning, and then you go ahead, okay? So this is a different perspective, uh, which sometimes is useful to understand the many algorithms. Okay. So long for uh, the, um, for the issue of uh, uh, theory solving. And um, I would like to tell you some, uh, the flavor of uh, how the main algorithms for theory solving work. Uh, I'm not going into the detail of that, I'm just giving you the flavor and then pointing uh, to references if uh, you are interested. Okay. The, the first, uh, well, we remember what we said uh, about theory solving. So a theory solver is not only something which is, has to solve, to be able to tell if a conjunction of literals is satisfiable or unsatisfiable, but it's also had other feature to, to be able to do. The first is able to identify the, the conflict set if uh, the set uh, given is unsatisfiable. Okay, if this is unsatisfiable, well, you are able to, you should be able to identify the subset of atoms which give you the inconsistency. The second is that it should be incremental. So if you add some new literals, you should not rebuild from scratch, but you should be able to, to uh, proceed uh, from where you left. Similarly, uh, when, uh, when you pop, you should be able to restore the status to undo steps uh, without uh, starting from scratch. Another important fact that you should be able to perform deductions if possible. So if there are some, you should be provided some literals, a list of the remaining literal, and uh, you should be able to say whether uh, the remaining literals are uh, uh, a consequence of a truth assignment to some remaining literal is a consequence of the, of the current uh, uh, assignment. So this is exactly the um, theory of propagation. So um, equality and an interpretive function is probably the simplest possible theory that you have in uh, in uh, in SMT and is a theory uh, which gives no interpretation to function symbol and to predicate symbols, apart from the fact that there are functions, okay? So the idea is that this typically uses a core theory solver um, with the following meaning. Uh, Sometimes, so you may think that the, the basic core of, uh, uh, of an SMT solver is a sub solver. That's not true. The basic core is an SMT solver with UF because this is, notice that UF uh, uh, can be applied to every theory because substantially every theory have, has equality and uh, has a function. So sometimes you can solve uh, problems in linear arithmetic only using UF. Okay, so you can deduce, uh, deduce or uh, imply or imply inconsistency on other theories like linear arithmetic only based on the fact that the pluses are functions, minuses are functions, uh, and, uh, and so they must be congruent. Okay, so UF is really, really simple. Uh, deducing is uh, O of n log n, so which is quite uh, fast. And there are versions of the algorithm which are fully incremental and backtrackable, and they can perform deductions. Um, some deductions, actually, uh, you can exhaustively uh, deduce uh, all equalities. So if an equality is a consistent, is a consequent of uh, uh, your current status, then the algorithm deduces it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a guarantee to, to be able to deduce these equalities, the negated equalities. Okay. Um, this is based on, uh, on a data structure called eGraph, uh, which is uh, uh, an extension of a data structure uh, able to detect equivalent classes called, called UnionFind. 
Uh, have you ever seen uh, union find data structures in the algorithm theory? Yes. Yes? No? Okay, union find are just algorithms which are very able, able to detect uh, very fast uh, equivalences, uh, to group classes of equivalences of, um, of tools. Okay. Uh, it supports uh, the lazy explanations, that is conflict set, and uh, but uh, minimality is not guaranteed. And also, it's it also fits very naturally to be extended to other theories, so to be integrated with, the, for instance, axioms. Okay, so here how it works. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, remember that uh, in uh, in SMT solver. The terms uh, are organized uh, as a DAG, uh, a data structure which is typically called uh, a term bank. So all the terms occurring in uh, all the uh, formulas and the theory atoms are organized in the big DAG, okay? So that you can share common subterms. This is called uh, a term bank typically in, uh, in a SMT solver, okay? Um, Okay, so the algorithm works uh, as follows. So you have a term bank, right? So a representation of all the terms that uh, are that occur in the formula. So for instance, you have f of a of b, so which is f. Ah, I forgot. This tree has a variable and constants as uh, um, as uh, uh, leaves. Okay, and then find. Uh, uh, function symbols also predicates. You can see see a predicate as a function over uh, whose uh, uh, codomain is boolean. Okay, so f of a of b can be re represented by this uh, sub dag here. f of f of b of b can be represented as this dag of f applied to f of b and b. Okay, as a second argument. You have a G of A here, which can be represented by this, and G of C, which is, can be represented by this. So this is the term bank related to these uh, uh, three formula here. Okay, can you see if uh, these uh, three formula is uh, satisfiable or unsatisfiable? I think it's it sums up. It, it is it is what sorry, unsatisfiable. It is unsatisfiable. Yes, indeed. In fact, we see the in the next uh, execution. The form is unsatisfiable due to conference and closure. Okay, so why? Uh, okay, so one once you have all the all this object organized in uh, um, in uh, uh, this term. Then you build progressive equivalence class for terms. So you you build equivalence classes of nodes in uh, in this uh, uh, in this graph, and uh, you and the idea of building equivalent classes is that uh, you uh, you put equivalences between uh, terms. So if uh, you have an every time you encounter an equality, you say that the two, between two terms you add the equality. Okay, and then merge the compute the equivalent classes through the the equalities and merge equivalent classes. So if your T and S are uh, are said to be equal, and you have already computed the equivalence class of T and the equivalence class of S, then of course the equivalent classes of T and S are are joined. Okay. So. So the idea is that for every, for all the steps such that TI and SI uh, belong pairwise to the same classes, then merge the equivalence class of F T1 to K and F S1 S K. So what does it mean? If uh, T1 belongs to the same equivalence class of S1, T2 belongs to the equivalent class of, S, of T, T2 and, and TK blah, 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 belongs to the equivalence class of SK, then you can conclude that these two guys 
belong to the same equivalence class by congruence. So you first uh, apply build the equivalent classes and then you apply congruence to further extend equivalent classes. When you have finished uh, computed equivalent classes due to equivalence and the congruence, then if T different from S, so you have a negative equality between two terms T and S, and T and S belong to the same equivalent class, then this of course is caused a conflict. So you, you can beat all the conflicts that you can, uh, that you can, uh, uh, you check all the neg negative qualities and see if there are conflicts. But also you can, you can also, now yet you have built the equivalence class, you can also deduce other atoms. So let's see an example here, okay? So if, uh, okay, so here we have f of, f, of, f of a, b equals a, and f of f of f, b, f of f of a, b, b equals c. So a, where is it? a should be equivalent to f of f of a, okay? Dotted the red lines are equivalents. But similarly, c here, is equivalent to f of f of a b. Okay. But now we can apply con congruence. Okay. And uh, uh, we know that f of f of uh, sorry f of a b is the same of a. Okay. So f of a b is equivalent to f of f of b. F of, f of a b is the same as f of f of a b b, okay? Because a is the same of f of a b, okay? So these two guys are, are uh, congruent, okay? But this also means that, so if these two guys are congruent, then also that also, a and, and f of f of f of a are congruent, and a and c are congruent. So this term c, the term f of f of b a, sorry, f of uh, f of a b b, um, and the term f of a b and the term a, all are all equivalent, okay? So this is equivalent to this, but this is equivalent to this, by congruence, so this is equivalent to this. So all those four terms are equivalent. Do you agree? You see this? Okay. As a consequence, you are asked, uh, uh, another consequence is that also G of A and G of C by congruence, we don't the same equivalence class, right? By congruence, G, if A is equivalent to C by this chain, then also G of A is the same as G of C, right? But now, okay, so we have propagated, we have built the, um, the E graph. But now from this E graph, we can uh, do something. Well, first of all, we can conclude that this is inconsistent, right? Oh, suppose that this, this constraints was not there. So imagine that the, you had only the qualities. You passed only the qualities. Then, and then you had uh, uh, the atom G of A equals G of C somewhere in the formula. Then you could deduce G of A equals G of C. In general, you can deduce the, all the atoms which co we, you can deduce all the atoms which are an equivalent, an equivalence between terms which belong to the same equivalence class. So this, uh, this tool has deductive capabilities. Okay. Also, imagine that this set of clauses here 
the set of uh, uh, literals here is just a, a tiny part of a much bigger set, okay? Involving uh, other, other pieces, blah, blah, blah. But this alone, this graph alone, uh, is able to infer uh, the, the conflict, is able to infer inconsistency. So imagine this graph as a tiny part of a much bigger graph. The violated inequality is this, right? So you have identified an equivalence class here. And then you have found that uh, two terms are uh, of this equivalent class should be different. So this atom will be part of the conflict set, of course, but also every element which caused by congruence the implication. So substantially, these two atoms here and these two atoms here have been used are atoms which caused the equivalence of these terms. So you can build the, the, conflict, uh, uh, the conflict set, which uh, is uh, um, this, the cause of, of the inconsistency. Okay? And notice that this is also incremental because you can, uh, when, you have, you are, uh, when you are in this uh, situation, for instance, Okay, you have built this conflict set. You can add, when you add the further elements, if you add the further equalities, you just add the equality and then apply, you know, find then the congruence. Again, so you can do this incremental. So this algorithm is in, intrinsically incremental in the elements you have. And if you add an, a negated equality, you just have a, one more check to do, uh, to check one more check to, for the, um, uh, to see if uh, a negative quality violates some of the equivalence class, okay? So this is, UF uh, is very simple, very fast, and, uh, uh, and very efficient, okay? And very often, and it's used uh, substantially in every theory solver, as a background in every theory solver. So when you pass a set of uh, elements uh, to uh, any theory solver, like a linear integer arithmetic, you, you even, apply UF to linear integer arithmetic because sometimes you can deduce something or find some inconsistency which is just due to the congruence, to equality and congruence of the, the operators. So also pluses, minuses, and, uh, and uh, small equal are functions and predicates, okay? So if you pretend that uh, uh, arithm arithmetical, for instance, operators are, are uh, um, Non um, are not uh, um, uh, interpreted and treat this as an interpretive function. Sometimes you can even find some simplification or some extra uh, equality of inference just due to the to the congress of uh, uh, of the arithmetic. So this is quite important. And this uh, very much uh, uh, the UF solver is very much in the core of every theory solver of every uh, SMT solver. Okay, is this uh, reasonably clear? Okay, another very popular um, the theory solver is uh, um, a subcase of difference logic, uh, the uh, linear arithmetic, which is difference logic. Difference logic uh, uh, is uh, a logic saying uh, um, in which every element uh, is written in the form uh, xi minus xj is more or equal than a constant. And this is, uh, even, th even though it's very simple conceptually, uh, this is uh, quite uh, useful and important in practice because uh, uh, this is, allows to represent a plenty many problems, including uh, um, real-time verification, scheduling, uh, Substantially everything which uh, deals with the progress of time. Okay. Uh, DL is polynomial. I mean, handling a set of inequalities in this form is, uh, is polynomial. If you are in the, regardless whether you are in the integers on, 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 the, um, on the rationals. Um, 
then if you add these equalities uh, uh, with the integers, you have a problem because uh, you have two cases split uh, and, uh, and this raises the complexity. But however, we assume that we have a set of problems in this form. Okay, what do we use? Uh, we use, uh, uh, for solving this problem, we use variations of uh, minimum path algorithms. Um, well, you may be surprised because uh, uh, we are using an algorithm which has nothing to do with logic. So this, uh, the Bellman Ford algorithms and uh, other variations are algorithms which uh, uh, are used to find the, the giving a one source place and a graph uh, and then direct a way to the graph. Uh, you can uh, find use it to find uh, the shortest path from one source place to all the other source nodes. Okay, this is a quadratic. Uh, this is a quadratic uh, algorithm, so in the sense that is uh, um, the cost is uh, uh, the product of the number of uh, the variables times the number of constraints or arcs. And uh, uh, substantially works as follows: so you build a graph, um, you build a graph in which you add. Uh, um, uh, in general, you you add the, typically when you have a constraints in the form. Uh, x uh, small or equal than, than the constant, so you have one single variable. Then you add the fake variable, x0, uh, whose intended meaning is that x0, uh, the value x0 is zero, okay? So it's what you call the source variable, uh, and which tells us uh, uh, something about uh, being, uh, um, being, uh, um, I mean, if you have that x uh, greater than equal than uh, five, uh, you can write this as x minus zero greater than equal than five, okay? And you call uh, this fake variable x zero, so uh, to be zero, so this is written as x minus x zero greater than equal than five, okay? Uh, so, the idea is that you represent this as a graph, as a reachability graph, in which uh, uh, xi minus xj smaller or equal than something, let's say suppose uh, 3, x4 minus x2 smaller or equal than 3, can be seen as uh, the distance from uh, uh, the arc linking x2 to x4 is, is minus smaller or equal than 3. So for instance, this set here, x4 minus x2, x4 minus x2 is more equal than three, means th that you have an arc or length three from x2 to x4. Why is more or equal here? Well, the intuition is that for sure you are at least one way to get from x2 to x4, which costs you three. But it may be the case that you have a better way somewhere. Okay, so the path here goes from here to here is a three. So for sure, you you have at least a, a chance to have a whose cost is three. But maybe you have a better path. Okay, so the trick is exactly that. So in the Bernard form performs some iterations and updates the, the distances in the following way. So whenever, uh, let me check, uh, well, initially the all uh, set are set for, you add the link from uh, uh, x0, 0 to xi, uh, uh, which is uh, 0. Then, uh, of course, uh, uh, if you can, uh, um, update progressively the, the values by exploiting the triangular. So if the distance, so for instance, let me find one case here. Uh, if you have, uh, um, say, oh, where is it? Uh, boom, 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 where is this value? So if, uh, for instance, uh, uh, from X3 and, to x4, 
you uh, you may have a better path. Uh, let me see an example here. Um, okay, so the as a starting point here, x zero to x uh, uh, three is weight zero. Okay, but you may notice that you, that you have a faster way, better way to, to pass from x0 to x3, which passes through x4, because the sum of these two arcs here is minus two. So the actual difference from here to here is not zero, but the best path to forget from x0 to x3 passes through, through here. Similarly, the best path from passing to x0 to, x, uh, to x1 is not the direct one, neither the second one, but is this path here. Okay, so substantially every time. So if your current best path from uh, node one to node three is uh, say five, but you have that the sum of the paths passing through another node is smaller, then you decide that the minimum path of that is is this bad okay so you update so this algorithm updates those values until it finds the minimum distance from x0 of every the minimum distance the minimum path from an imaginary source x0 to everybody else okay and notice that the value that you have here at the end is one possible model of the machine okay well interestingly you can detect inconsistency and the inconsistencies are situations where you have a cycle, a negative cycle. A negative cycle is a cycle where the sum of all the weights is negative. Okay. Well, you understand that this is, uh, uh, this violates the uh, triangular inequality, right? So, if you go from here to here uh, with minus two, and you go from here to here with minus two, and you go back here for minus one here, uh, you notice overall this cycle is negative, but this is not possible, right? Because this means that x1 minus x1 minus x3 is more equal than minus two, okay? And uh, that uh, um, uh, x2 minus x1 is more or equal than 2. But if you combine those two constraints here, okay, you get that x2 minus x3 is more or equal than 0. Okay, you got it? But if you say that, then you um, sorry, uh, x yes, x two minus x one is more or equal than zero, right? But then we know that x three minus x two is more or equal than minus one here, which is not possible because this is if you reverse this, this says that x two minus x three should be greater equal than than one and this is in violation with these two guys okay you get it so this means that uh, the uh, this is uh, uh, contradictory do you see that this these two contradicts this right Okay. Apply triangular inequalities. Okay. X2 minus X1 is more equal than 2. My plus X1 minus 3 is more equal than minus 2. This means that X2 minus X3 is more equal than 0. Are we all there? Okay. But this is in contradiction with uh, with this one. 
because this one can be seen as uh, x2 minus x3 greater equal than one. Okay, these two guys are in, so every negative cycle here is an inconsistency. So a negative cycle here reveals an inconsistency, reveals that there's something wrong. And also it reveals automatically the conflict set because the, co the negative cycle is actually conflict set, is what causes your, uh, your, uh, um, your, your set to be inconsistent. You don't need the other constraint to say that. You don't need the green constraint here to say that this graph is inconsistent. All these three constraints here are enough. Okay. But also notice that this allows you to infer other constraints. So suppose you didn't have uh, this constraint on board. Okay. Well, from this, you, so this is part of your uh, uh, literals to be assigned yet. Then you immediately realize that from this loop here, that the, the distance from here to here cannot be minus one. Okay, so you can infer by triangular distance that the arc from here to here is four. It should be uh, um, smaller equal than four. Okay, so you automatically uh, infer that uh, this arc uh, should not. So that any arc in the opposite direction, any candidate arc here is false. Okay, so you can add one by one the, the remaining arc and check whether they are in conflict with the current with the current distance between these two. Okay, so you can perform unsat core. Um, you, sorry, the conflict set. Uh, you can infer. Uh, um, uh, you can do a field deduction. Well, there are. I don't get. To, I'm not going to that. But there are version of uh, unsat Berman Ford which can be built, which are fully incremental and retractable. So you can rebuild from so other new things and just update and drop parts and, and start from scratch from and and uh, reset the status uh, without starting from scratch. Okay, so this is for difference logic. Uh, well, linear arithmetic. Linear arithmetic is nothing else that uh, the simplex. Do you, well, I assume everybody knows the simplex. Linear programming. Yeah. Well, the simplex is just so. a, a technique which uh, uh, works by having a set of constraints and uh, adding some uh, new variables to uh, select variables or base variables, which uh, determine the distance from uh, the current constraint and uh, uh, the, the value. And then you play, you play looking for a solution, uh, anti, uh, play uh, toggling uh, the values of some solution until you find a, a solution of this point. Substantially, so you try to move uh, internally to some point. Uh, well, I'm not going to, to describe the, the the simplex here, this is just uh, substantially uh, is a operation of manipulation on uh, on some matrices. Okay, uh, interesting. There is uh, uh, well, originally the simplex was not considered, of course, for solving; was considered for um, optimization. But fortunately, uh, well, in uh, uh, I think two thousand six. Uh, uh, Duterte and Demura came with a very nice algorithms, uh, very nice variation of uh, the uh, simplex, in which uh, which was completely incremental, uh, 
was uh, a completely incre um, incremental and backtrackable, who was able to find the conflict sets, and he was also able to perform a uh, uh, theory uh, to detect uh, values, uh, detect new atoms. I, I leave this uh, for the literature because uh, this is uh, quite uh, complex to, to describe. Um, one remark is very important when uh, you deal with uh, arithmetic. Well, you may be well, you may be puzzled that you use uh, uh, numerical devices to do logic, right? How this happens? Well, what about uh, rounding? Well, you know that all the now when every time we, we do roundings, uh, we introduce a small error. So can we perform? Can we afford the doing errors that like that when you reason a logic? The answer is definitely no. We cannot afford them. And in fact, so this is something important. All every uh, SMT solver do not work with the floating point arithmetic. So the internal representation of the value of the variables when in the theories like in arithmetic or or also nonlinear arithmetic is not a floating point. Okay, they use uh, also rationals and infinite precision rationals. So substantially, there are many packages which uh, can do that. But, but uh, the idea is that a rational is represented by a, a, a pair of two integers, and this is an infinite precision integer. So substantially, there are lists potentially unbounded the lists of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of integers, which are as long as, uh, as, as, it, as it's needed. Well, this overall typically uh, slows down the, the process. Okay, so it may load, load down or up to a two or three factor. But is absolutely necessary for precisions. In SMT, we cannot afford introducing uh, a rounding mistake, a rounding errors. Okay. Uh, so both in, with integers and with uh, uh, rationals, we need using uh, infinite precision packages. Actually, they are not infinite precision packages. Nothing is infinite in, uh, in within a computer. There are I would have liked it, uh, I would have preferred the name uh, unbounded precision. But the, the actual bound uh, is uh, the memory, uh, the memory of your computers, of course. So there is no bound in the length of uh, precision. And uh, all, uh, of course, those packages do a lot of simplification between uh, denominators and the uh, denominators and the numerators. So this is quite complicated. And, but they are very efficient and very popular. So they are open source, uh, freely available uh, libraries. For that. Okay, integers. Well, integers is complicated. Integer is complicated because uh, um, uh, integer is much harder than uh, reals. So linear integer arithmetic is NP hard, whereas uh, linear uh, real uh, rational arithmetic is uh, is polynomial. Okay, so uh, you may have uh, when you are doing uh, uh, reasoning on linear integer arithmetic, uh, then this is a compromise of different uh, algorithms. What you do is typically you start uh, reasoning on the rational, on, on the rational. So you pretend uh, uh, you first find a solution, uh, look for an, a solution in the rationals. Well, of course, if you fail to find a solution in the rational, there cannot be any solution in the integers. And then, uh, when you have a solution on the rational, and, and you have characterized uh, your space of solutions of uh, rationals. Then there is a bound of techniques that you can uh, uh, represent. Uh, well, typically, one typical thing you do is uh, doing branch and bound. So, well, once you have a given range, you you get so 
you get once you have a candidate, um, you have a, a model on the, on the rationals, then uh, which of course is not integers typically, you impose, uh, for instance, the value is 3.4, you impose the constraint that uh, um, x should be strictly smaller than 3 or x should be strictly greater than 4. Okay? So if you have three dot something, so you have a model which is a three dot something, and of course it's not going to set a model in the integers, then you you do bench and bound and you impose uh, you branch in the sense try uh, a value which is smaller or equal than three or a value which is greater or equal than four. And you go ahead and do this search this way. Of course, every time reasoning trying to reason on the um, on uh, the um, on the um, on the rationals because this is much faster or oh, this is called the branch and brown there are uh, a set of uh, sub uh, techniques sorry there's in, in internal branch and bound there are some manipulators in which you can uh, rewrite the formulas in such a way by which you can uh, cut some uh, reformulate the problem in a much more suitable way. You may have, uh, you may add some uh, particular cuts, the so called Gomery cuts, which uh, are able to re further reduce the search space and uh, give a solution. Also, another technique which is very popular on uh, the, um, on uh, the, um, um, not only on the integers, but on uh, the hard theories, so theories which alone are NP complete, uh, is uh, what is called the splitting on demand. So when you have uh, to to do some splitting inside uh, the theory reasoning, and typically the theory reason is not good at doing a search. Uh, what you can do is that you add the, 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 the split you are forced to do as a close and you return it to the SAT solver. So for instance, if in branch and bound, if uh, you are a given point, you are forced to split the case, to do some case splitting, for instance, X smaller or equal than three or X greater or equal than four, rather than trying these two blocks separately, you just add the close x smaller or equal than three or x greater or equal than four to the formula and then give it back to the SAT solver and the SAT solver will reason on that. The, the good news for uh, this technique is that uh, uh, the way this case split is handled is much more efficient than uh, the pure case split in which you substantially expand explicitly the binary tree of all possible combination. Because in doing that, the SAT solver will use by jumping, learning, and all the very smart tricks that he, he can use, okay? So it's a smarter search than the, than the technique. Again, this is uh, quite complicated overall. It involves uh, many techniques uh, and uh, uh, algorithm coming from uh, integer linear programming and the linear programming and uh, I will refer to the Lichler tool for whoever is, is more interested. So in particular this is a very good paper by Alberto Grigio who tells a lot about that. Okay, arrays. What time is it? 10, uh, 15. Do you want a break? Yes, break. Ten minutes break. We'll uh, start. Well, we start again at, at uh, uh, twenty-five. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. We can start again. Okay. So another theory. Uh, which has a lot of interest, uh, in particular when combined with others, 
is the theory of arrays, which has a um, lot of importance both in uh, dealing with uh, software verification, hardware verification, and, and others. Um, so remember that the um, a theory array is a theory which has substantially two functions to interpret the function and deals with the, the uh, update of uh, array values. Okay, so you read and write elements on array value. The two predicates, so the two functions, sorry, is write. Uh, write is a function which takes an array, an index, and an element and returns an updated version of the array in which you have written element E on the array A in position I, okay? The other one is read, read A, uh, J. Uh, it reads uh, element of index J in the, uh, in the array A and returns the value, okay? Well, the... Um, the, all the theory is based on uh, uh, substantially three axioms. The first two are known as McCarthy axiom, the other um, uh, yeah. they are not. So the axiom uh, is, uh, says that for all uh, arrays, for all indexes of the array, for elements uh, which you want to write, the result, if you, of reading, on, uh, L, on position i, an array which, uh, in which, which is the result of writing element e in position i from an original array a is e. What does it mean? If you write an element e, an element, um, e in position i in an array, and then look what is there after that operation, you will find the E value, of course, okay? The second axiom says that if uh, uh, for all uh, A, E, and for all pairs of position uh, I, J, um, if I is different from J, okay? Then the result of uh, reading uh, from position J uh, from the array, which is the result of writing uh, the element E in, uh, in position I, okay, is uh, the same of read AJ. So this says substantial that uh, the act of writing does not touch all, uh, does not affect all the other indexes. Okay. Notice that these two uh, axioms are some way complementary. You could rewrite the, the first action as uh, for all uh, A, I, J, E. If I equal J, then uh, read, write, I, uh, I, E, J equal E. Okay? But we simply inline this uh, equality. Do you see this? So this says, if you write something in position I in an array, if you read in position I, will you'll find what you have written there. If you read then in in position in all the other position, you 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 read what was already there. Okay. This is quite uh, clear, I would say, right? Okay. Is this clear? Any question about this? These two axioms. Uh, question. Yes, please. Uh, is there a memory model behind this um, uh, this language? For example, if we write something in one cloud, is it possible to read it back in another cloud? Yeah. No. No. I mean. The point is, okay, the model is that uh, array, so the variable array here, A, is a version of, it may be the version of the same array, okay? So is a, um, a snapshot, is not the, okay, you should not think of A here as an array a variable like you have in C, but it's a status of a given array, okay? A 
if you write something uh, into an array, what you have is a different array. Okay, okay. so it's a pure so function. It describes the evolution, the evolution of a given array. Okay, so, so the, the idea is that uh, uh, typically after writer you will uh, write and return a new version or a new uh, status of an array. So uh, A, rather than define this an array, I would define this as a status of, a, of an array. Okay, do you agree? Yes, yeah, so it's a pure functional without any side effects. Yes, it's a pure functional. Yes, it's a purely functional. Um, another axiom says that for all A from B, for all, if for all index uh, uh, red A i is red B i, then the two arrays are identical. Okay. So if for all possible indexes, okay, the, the element are pairwise identical, then the arrays are, are pairwise identical. Notice that here I give simplicity a notion of array of equality of the array, which is similar to the is different from uh, that of C. So they are identical, but they are not the same array. Okay. So this A equal B means they are equal. They contain the same, they have the same contain, uh, content, but they are not the same array in the software sense. So if you think to a C program, where array are substantially pointers, okay constant pointers, dynamic pointers, whatever, but this is not the, the A equals B in that sense. This is all content of A is equal to the content of B. And notice that here we made no hypothesis of the kind of uh, on the indexes on, on uh, the, uh, the, the value of A and B. In fact, arrays is not a theory, but a generical theory because it can be instantiated to the, to the sort, so the kind of, uh, to the signature of uh, their elements. You can have an array of uh, integers, you can have, have an array of rationals, you can have an array of any object belonging to an, uh, the theory. And similarly, what is the index? Well, you can have integers, you can have uh, bounded integers, you can be vectors. So array is, is sort of parametrical theory to some extent, which is parametric in uh, uh, the type uh, of uh, the elements and the type of the indexes. Okay. So typically arrays uh, is combined, is used uh, not as a standalone, but combined with other theories. Okay, a theory which decides uh, what kind, of, how to manipulate the indexes. Well, the two candidates are typically integers and bit vectors. And uh, the content, the, the theory which describes the content of the array, integer, reals, uh, bit vectors, uh, whatever you may want to put there. Okay. Okay, so let's see an example. Uh, suppose uh, we have uh, this uh, formula here, right? I and right A I V equal right B I V and V is not identical to W. Well, we see this is obviously um, uh, this is uh, uh, something inconsistent and V and W are, are, are values, right? Uh, so suppose that uh, as a result of operation, which we take whatever uh, array A and write the value V in I, and then uh, we take whatever array B and uh, we write in position I V. Okay, by W. 
and v is different from w, then it, obviously the two arrays cannot be identical again, regardless of a and b, because of course they will be different at least for the element in position i. So this is inconsistent. Okay. Let's see how we do that. Okay. So we write this. So this is our starting point. But then we can produce two instantiations of, uh, um, of the axiom number one. Okay. So we can say that read the result of reading uh, uh, in position i, the result of writing a i v must be w. Okay. So this is an instantiation of this array of this axiom. Okay. You see? Similarly, we say from B and W. Okay. But then, um, by uh, uh, UF here, we are. Uh, uh, okay. So since we, okay, we have uh, uh, this uh, equality, by this equality here, these two arguments are the same, right? Okay. So by UF, by congruence, we have the, also the result of read. If you read, identical to apply the the read function from uh, to two identical pairs of values i is identical to i and this is identical to this then the result should be identical this is just congruence okay remember that you can apply congruence regardless the meaning of the functions okay so here we have we can infer that v equals w so these two guys here are identical, and and we um, we have uh, that v equals w, but v equals w of course is in contrast with this, so this form is inconsistent. You see? Okay, so theories of arrays, the theory for arrays typically. Uh, work by instantiating on demand instances of these three axioms. So these are the ones which are more purely automatic reason, so to say, right? Because the, the, the theory of arrays is interesting because it's very, very logic based. Unlike other theory which use different tricks, uh, uh, theory of arrays is really logic based because it really does automatic deduction. And substantially does some instance, uh, uses some instantiations uh, of, of array depending uh, on uh, depending on uh, uh, the, the terms that he has. Okay. So since uh, we had these two equalities here, he we are able to deduce to apply this. Uh, uh, so since we have uh, this uh, thing and we are interested in knowing what what happens in i, we we try to read what happens after in, in i after doing this. So think how what, how we can conclude that this is inconsistent. Okay. So how a human being thinks this is inconsistent? Well, you say v and w cannot be true equal because all the arrays after I'm, after reading that will be identical this means that in particular will be identical on in position i okay which is in constant with this so what i do to prove this i'm going to read what happens in position i on those two arrays so it comes natural to to see what what is the result of reading position i in these two arrays Okay, so I apply the, the algorithm here. 
So I want to I want to see what happening what's happening in position I of this. So the the axiom which allows me to see is is this one. So the only one who has this expression on on board is uh, is this one. So I have instantiate this uh, this array for these two uh, uh, terms. Notice again I'm I want to look in position I. So the natural the only axiom which is of health, which contains this term is this one. So I apply this axiom twice, and then I just apply in congruence. So theory of the array reason by instantiating in a smart way uh, um, the, the axioms and then uh, using congruence. And if there are combinations of theories, then you apply also the, the other theory. Okay, it is clear. Uh, notice, by the way, that this axiom here, of course, holds also in the, in the opposite direction. Okay, but this is due to congruence. Okay, if A equal B, then obviously read A I and read B I is the same by congruence. A is the same of B and I is the same of I. So obviously this axiom holds also in both direction, but this is for, for due to congruence. Okay, are we there? Okay, bit vector. Okay, bit vector is a big. Uh, okay, any other question on uh, on our theory of arrays? Anybody? Uh, sorry, can you uh, briefly explain why this theory is uh, decidable? What you uh, mean? I mean, I uh, mean, we can prove it by using those axiom but there are infinite uh, instances uh, of each axiom so how can we well, automatically that, find okay, it smart point but you have okay excellent point but um you need a number of possible instantiations which is uh, at most uh, the number of uh, well, don't remember if it's at most or, or a function of that the number of different atoms occurring in your formula. So think about terms, right? You are in your formula, you make a finite amount of uh, terms in the form of write and read. Okay, so you need an instantiation only for those terms here. You are right, in, so if you are right. Uh, uh, to say that potentially an array can be infinite or unbounded. So I make no hypothesis on the size. But if you sum all operations that you do, okay, you are dealing with the finite number of elements or on the fixed number of elements on the array. So all you have to do is instantiation for that value. Okay, got it? Okay, I see. Thanks. So substantially it means that uh, you don't need uh, investigating what happens in the, in the index for the indexes which are not touched by the, by the reason. And also well, it may be the case that uh, you don't know the value of the place where you are instantiation. Okay, so it's a generic variable. But you know for sure that it's one. Okay, so if you have, uh, you, if you make uh, n acts of writings, so if your formula uh, contains at most uh, n uh, instances of a write uh, function, you know but for sure that this will involve at most n, n different indexes in the array. At the most, because it may be the case that sometimes you reuse the same, the same 
element. So substantially what happens in the other slots is, is not interesting, is not involved. Okay. Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, are you there? Cool. Uh, okay, big vectors. Big vectors are a completely different story here. Um, well, I already explained what a big vector is, right? So in a big vector, uh, a term represents uh, a word, a word in uh, a sequence of bits, a fixed, well, typically we assume a fixed uh, length, although there exists a version of the theory of big vector with the unbounded length, okay? Uh, and uh, substantially all the operators are the kind of operator that you use uh, in typically within a CPU, so right? Uh, concatenation, uh, cutting, uh, taking some bits, uh, uh, well, of course, writing and reading, of course, uh, uh, taking some uh, um, the, uh, extracting some bits, extracting some subwords, uh, uh, arithmetical, so all the arithmetical, operation that you can do on uh, on array, consider them uh, either positive as a positive integers or a negative ones. In one case, I use the standard binary encoding, this, the other I use the complement to encoding. Okay. Uh, shifts, uh, bitwise operations, uh, multipliers and uh, others. Um, so typically, uh, Again, here is uh, there is a frago of uh, uh, of techniques. One uh, technique uh, which is sometimes useful is to encode everything into uh, integer uh, bounded integer arithmetic, a uh, modulo m. So you encode uh, every word uh, of uh, n bit as uh, 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 an integer ranging from zero to two, the n minus one bit. And you treat uh, everything as if uh, you are dealing with uh, 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 arithmetical integer operations. Sometimes, for some applications, this works, but there are some operators which are very badly handled with that. And one is, for instance, uh, the um, one is uh, the uh, bitwise operations when when you do the so the XOR or the AND, uh, bitwise AND, bitwise XOR or the bitwise uh, uh, OR of uh, two variables, that's very bad, okay? So it's substantially you need uh, getting back to bit by bit. And um, also the, the shift by a, a variable uh, amount is something that you cannot handle. So this is one possible approach. So you use a, a model to N arithmetic. Ah, by the way, I didn't say how to handle Boolean uh, uh, modulo n uh, arithmetic. Uh, there's a, a simple way to do that, but you simply add an extra variable. So if you are able, uh, handling uh, integer arithmetic modulo m, where m is typically a power two, okay, what you have is you introduce some uh, uh, extra fake variable, sigma, and uh, you, you say operation plus sigma m equal n. So, so the operation uh, term uh, equal modulo m, uh, uh, another term, is equivalent to say term plus sigma m equal term, where sigma is an integer, right? Because you may have. Uh, multiple roundings of uh, of the value and of course bounding the term in from zero to to to, to, to m minus one so you can encode modular arithmetic into arithmetic into integer arithmetic by just adding uh, uh, slack variables slack integer variables and bounding the value of, uh, of the arithmetic between a given number okay so you can do that uh so so typically what typically a big vector do is have, behave either lazily or eagerly lazy uh okay lazy means uh, that uh, you as we've seen 
see a theory as uh, compute the Boolean, the Boolean uh, um, structure of the formula of all uh, uh, terms and then solve the conjunction uh, separately. Either by using this into arithmetic or to handle a different way, which I will show you in the next slide. The eager is simply encode everything into SAT. Well, but typically in both cases, uh, typically before the solving, one key point of a bit uh, arithmetic of a bit vector is you try to apply the writing rules, simplification rules, and whatever rules you may think uh, to simplify the formula as much as possible. So to try to infer anything, and only when the, nothing else is left, uh, you you write it as a fine encoding into either linear arithmetic or pure SAT. Encoding to pure SAT means uh, uh, is also called uh, bit blasting. Okay, so substantially, many um, I would say most solver use uh, a meager approach. So simplify as much as possible, use uh, rewrite as much as possible, blah blah. But at the end of the story, use a SAT solver. Or you can use uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an la a lazy one in which either you encode everything into linear integer arithmetic, or what you can do is uh, okay, shift uh, uh, a shift to uh, a split. Uh, you may do lazy bliss blasting. So every time uh, you have a branch, so you you compute the the binary the Boolean abstraction of the formula. So that some uh, bull uh, bit vector term uh, like uh, well, like uh, say this is uh, a, this is a bit vector atom. Okay. Well, okay. No, sorry. This is a bit vector. This is a bit vector atom. Can be uh, labeled and abstract into some uh, boolean atom as uh, a flash boolean atom as uh, usual. Okay. And in every in every branch, uh, you be blast uh, the the uh, the conjunction of literals, so the truth assignment, uh, separately. For instance, by uh, you rewrite uh, the this as adding the um, variables, a fresh variable for every atom here. Okay. So substantially, the the result is uh, so you do that by uh, substituting every bit vector atom with AI and uh, uh, adding uh, this conjunction. Okay. So substantially, phi is bit vector satisfiable if and only if phi p is and psi is satisfiable. Okay. You just rewrote, and this is the bit blasting part, and. Uh, in this case, uh, you can use, as a theory solver, you can use a second instance of a SAT solver, okay? In which you use it under a, a SAT solver under assumption. So substantially, uh, if uh, phi p is uh, a truth assignment to the, uh, the Boolean abstraction of p, then uh, you can invoke, uh, as a theory solver, a SAT solver over phi under the assumption of the truth values of uh, AI. Blah, blah, blah. So if you have, this is the list of labeling of all the atoms of the formula, you have found a, a truth assignment on the values of A, which we call, we call uh, phi mu p, and we use this as a list of assumptions by which to solve the the encoding of this formula here. You see this? So substantially, you, are, you use a second SAT solver as a theory solver. And the fact that it's incremental, the SAT solver is incremental, plays the fact that the theory solver is incremental. The fact that SAT solver uh, returns on a SAT core that we have seen uh, in last week can be used as a, as a conflict set. So why is this convenient? Can be convenient sometimes with respect to encode everything. Well, the encoding is much smaller because you use only that you encode this on demand. So you encode only the parts that are relevant for you. 
But notice that if you have a truth assignment, then the encoding can be further simplified, right? Because this may cause some unipropagations and uh, the, substantially your SAT solver every time uh, reasons only on the part of interest for it. Okay. And you can do this uh, incrementally. Okay, just to say that uh, there are, in general, a big vector solver is something very complicated because it does lots of work and try in particular, it does some per processing, uh, uh, try to encode. Uh, well, there is also this dichotomy from a Boolean uh, clause of length one and a bit because a bit is considered as a Boolean variable and uh, a word of length one is, is considered as a term. So you have to be the map between these two. So the first bit uh, of, um, of one word, which the word is a term, can be used as, an, as a Boolean atom in order to drive uh, some other parts. Okay, so, which means it's a formula. So you have to write some bridge uh, saying, for instance, that uh, uh, the bit uh, A3 is the same as, uh, the uh, eighth, the third bit of A equals to one. Okay, so you have to add some bridge, uh, bridge formulas in order to convert to link the value of the Boolean value of a, of a variable to the bit value of uh, uh, the ith bit uh, if that bit is used as a, uh, in a control role. Sometimes, so in the ideal world, in form verification on the hardware, control bit and data bit will be completely separated. Unfortunately, this is not typically not the case in designs. So you have to bridge. So sometimes there are some bits which are used as control input or as a control bits for something else. Okay, in this case, you have to make a bridge of these two concepts. So you have to introduce a var Boolean variable which is true if and only if that bit is one. Then you, another important fact is the analysis of the, uh, of the system and try to uh, uh, distinguish, to draw a line between what is control and what is data. What should be treated as Boolean reasoning and what should be treated as a term reasoning. Uh, then you have to remove uh, variables which do not have uh, any constraints, or do not have any role. Notice that another thing that you can do in a uh, bit vectors is, is that sometimes you may have a solution even if uh, the bit vector has less bits. Okay, so some part of a solution does not require that size of the few bits. So you may shrink uh, the, 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 the size of some words, and this uh, reduces significantly the, the, the fractal. Frontier propagation is understanding again where what is a frontier between data and uh, and uh, and the input. If the S expansion is not uh, normalization, so the formula. So this all builds uh, on the term bank. So this gives a, a simplified version. Then uh, you can do lots of things like uh, eliminating concatenations uh, so by just renaming uh, a variable elimination. If you have uh, equivalences, just you can drop the intermediate equivalence. Elimination of concatenations, so just uh, treat them directly. You can apply deduction rules, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, you can use uh, some uh, techniques like either encoding to, to bit vector, to SAT or encoded to linear integer arithmetic. Depending whether there is a dominance of uh, arithmetical parts, Notice that dealing bitwise of arithmetical operation is very painful because typically when you have a multiplier, you're, you are going to die if you do, if you pass it to a sub solver. So if you have a lots of arithmetical reasoning, it's a good idea to encode this into arithmetic. Instead, if you don't, that's probably is better to do bit blasting. And so on. So this uh, variety of strategies, and again, I, I point you to the literature if, uh, if you are interested. Okay, this uh, closes uh, today's class. 
Tomorrow we'll see, we discuss about the combination of theories and on Friday we'll see uh, advanced SMP functionalities. Uh, just one point, uh, so Friday we do at uh, 1 p.m., okay? Agreed? Okay, excellent. So thank you very much, everybody. I see you tomorrow, same time. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.